Well, welcome. Uh, I'm Kyle Reese, Executive Director of the One Jacks Institute. And along with our Executive Director Emerita Nancy Bronner, uh, we continue these conversations of thought leaders in our community. Uh, and we are so grateful to have Mari Kuriashi, who is the president of the Jesse Ball DuPont, DuPont Fund. And Mari, I, I don't want to embarrass you, but I do want to read a little bit of your uh, very impressive uh, resume. Uh, prior to joining the fund, Mari co-founded the groundbreaking uh, crowdfunding philanthropy site, Global Giving with Dennis Whittle and served as president until 2018. Uh, the mission of Global Giving is connecting donors with grassroots, grassroots projects around the world, providing a vetting platform for donors and training and education for nonprofits. Uh, in addition to her native Japanese, Mari also speaks Russian, Italian, and French. Uh, she earned an undergraduate degree in history from Harvard University and did graduate work in Russian and Japanese history and politics at Harvard and Georgetown Universities. And she's also completed the advanced management program at Harvard Business School. So for mine and Nancy's benefit, we will keep this conversation in English, but that is a very impressive uh, list of languages that you speak. And Mari, we are so honored uh, that you would spend a little bit of time with us today. So welcome. Thank you, Kyle and Nancy. And that was a very fulsome introduction. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us about yourself and how you came to the Jesse Ball DuPont Fund. Sure, as, as you said, um, uh, just prior to coming uh, to the Jesse Ball DuPont Fund, I had been uh, running Global Giving. Before that, I had been working at the World Bank. And I must, uh, I must admit that every single one of my career moves was not something I had anticipated or, you know, planned for. I, you know, studied Russian and Sovietology that my so, you know, unit of analysis fell apart and my discipline failed to predict the single most important thing that happened to my unit of analysis. So I was like, well, I don't know, grad school, it's not, not looking so promising here. Yeah. So, you know, I heard the World Bank was hiring and I didn't know much about the World Bank. I really didn't know much about international development, but I knew something about Russia. So I was like, well, if they're looking for Russia specialists, I'll, I'll, I'll apply, which is how I ended up at the World Bank, where I had an amazing time, uh, you know, for over uh, a decade working not just on Russia, but on business innovation, change management, strate uh, strategic um, directions. And it, you know, I thought I was going to be at the World Bank forever. Then, you know, the dot-com boom happened and I was like, you know, there's some things that technology can really transform in the field of international development. So time to go do a startup. That's how, you know, Dennis and I started Global Gaming. Not something either of us had really been thinking about until that moment, right? And so Global Gaming, now there, I knew that I didn't want to hang around forever. You know, there are too many uh, institutions out there. Uh, you know, Nancy, you know, you, you probably appreciate this, where uh, especially in nonprofits, they get so closely identified with that individual yeah. that it's hard to sort of disentangle the organization from the individual. And, you know, being a founder sort of has that added level of identification. So I knew it was time to leave global giving, and I didn't really know what I would seek, but, you know, a headhunter that I knew quite well approached me and said, you know, this isn't necessarily something you might be looking for, but I think you would really enjoy this. So she explained the opportunity here at the Jesse Ball DuPont Fund, and it, it really sounded like a place where I could see the needle move on changes that we seek. And notwithstanding the fact that I'm very proud of what Global Giving has done and you know, is continuing to do, it's, it's a global crowdfunding platform, you know, intermediating hundreds of millions of dollars, but it is all over the world. And I don't, you know, I'm not all over the world. I'm in Washington DC running an organization and I don't get to see tangibly 
the, the things that changed. So that's, that's when um, this opportunity came about and I was very taken with the possibility that I could be directly involved in the changes we seek. Mm -hmm. That's great. Can you talk a little bit about the initiatives that uh, the DuPont Fund is involved in right now? Some of the priorities? Sure. So, you know, one of the things I, I did when I came to the fund was to try and sort of get my own mind around what is it that the fund does and what is it that it does well and where can it play a catalytic role? And I, we landed on two strategic directions, really grounded in what you know the fund had been doing, but really putting a name on it. And uh, those two things were placemaking and equity. Now, placemaking, you know, you could say that this beautiful building that I'm in, uh, that Sherry, you know, sort of dreamed up from. Uh, the hulk of a building that, have, that was falling apart into this amazing LEED certified center for nonprofits in downtown is, is a perfect example of placemaking, creating spaces where members of our community truly feel that they belong. And the equity angle is really about how we, I mean, I, I firmly believe as a, as a matter of public policy that Diversity leads to creativity and inclusion creates to, uh, leads to engagement. And with creativity and engagement, a community is able to solve many, many more problems than it can when those two factors don't coexist. So we really seek to create vibrant, inclusive communities in the places that Jesse Dupal Dupont, you know, lived, worked, played, and loved. I mean, that that's the 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 love she had for those communities is truly manifest in the fund. And so, building on that commitment to place, we said, okay, we're about placemaking and equity. So, in that vein, one of the things that really was exciting in uh, in the first year that I showed up was uh, when the city asked us to partner with them on Lift Every Voice and Sing Park mm -hmm. in La Villa, which as you as you well know and your, read, uh, your uh, listeners know, is a, you know, is sort of the heart of the historic African-American neighborhood, which today is largely empty. You know, it's, it's a function of a lot of things between the highways coming through in the 1950s and you know many American cities, the African American neighborhoods were sort of riven by these highways, compounded by, uh, in fact, you know integration that allowed people many more choices about where to live. You know the crack epidemic, all all sorts of factors, you know, led to. Uh, urban renewal in the 1990s, which led to so much of the built environment in La Villa being lost. And yet it was in its day, you know, either the Harlem of the South, or as Ennis Davis likes to say, you know, Harlem is the Jacksonville of the North. Right. It was an amazing, creative, diverse place that not only was the heart of the African-American community, but the, you know, the first Jewish synagogue was built in La Villa. The uh, Chinese laborers who built the railways lived in La Villa. It was, you know, they had more hotels and restaurants than the rest of Jacksonville in, in the 1920s. So to be able to begin to remind people of that incredible storied past through the creation of Lift Every Voice and Sing Park, which, you know, Lloyd Washington just championed, you know, tirelessly. And to be able to sort of help that come into being with, you know, Parks and Rec, with Walter Hood, who was hired by Parks and Rec to sort of reimagine the space. That just felt like placemaking, equity, inclusion, ticks off all the boxes. So it, it's, a, it's an amazingly exciting initiative. That's great. And 
as you as you think about uh, and you've been uh, in Jacksonville for a while now, uh, what are you most hopeful when about when you look at our city and kind of the direction it's heading? I think that I mean you've you've probably seen reports about how Jacksonville is now experiencing a dramatic inflow of people. It's like in the top ten cities in the United States in terms of inflow of people. Obviously, this is sort of, you know, partly an outcome of the pandemic when people started feeling, well, maybe I don't want to be in a studio apartment in a, you know, major city where, you know, life certainly came to a screeching halt for the last 12 months. Maybe I want a little bit more room and Jacksonville has a lot of room, right? It is one of the largest cities by uh, physical area. But it is also, I think, a place with amazing gems. When I came here two years ago, you know, I was thrilled to find Shamblin's bookstore. I mean, it's as, it's as amazing as Powell's in Oregon, but everyone knows Powell's. Mm -hmm. Most people don't know Shamblin's, right? It's got Sunray Cinema, which is like this amazing cultural institution that no longer exists in most American cities because of real estate and whatever. It's got, you know, great restaurants that can hold their own, you know, against any other restaurant in uh, the United States. And yet they're unknown, relatively unknown, even in the city. Like, I'll run into people who are like, oh, community loves? Where's that? You know, but it, you know, we've got a James Beard, you know, awardee baker at Community Loves. That's an amazing thing. And it's popular, certainly. But again, you know, it's not as well known as some, you know, fancy uh, bakery in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. So the pockets of excellence exist. So the building blocks are there. And I think with the sort of influx of people, our you know, ability to come together around initiatives like Lift Every Voice in St. Park, um, that feels like, you know, as a historian, I know sometimes these sort of wellsprings of optimism come up and then they dissipate. Mm -hmm. But sometimes they take off, right? right. And it feels like there's, there's a wellspring of optimism and forward momentum, I would love to be able to be, play a small part in catalyzing that momentum into actual takeoff. That's great. You know, catalyzing that momentum, um, and you mentioned pockets of excellence. One of the challenges in Jacksonville um, for many years has been um, the, the fact that they are pockets, that, that people are not aware of these wonderful assets all around town. And from your description of placemaking and equity, it seems that the DuPont Fund will play uh, a significant role in perhaps helping our community um, even understand and appreciate what is available here. So thank you for, for that work that you're doing. This, this past year especially um, has been really challenging. Um, as you would well know, uh, for the Asian American community. Um, can you talk a little bit about your perspective on the, uh, how that has felt as a member of the AAPI community? Absolutely. And, you know, this, I'm going to put a personal slant on it, obviously, right? So I, I was born in Japan. I'm Japanese. And, you know, so for the first half of my life, I experienced my identity as being one of the majority, right? I, I was in a community where, you know, representation, well, I'm, I'm, I look just like, you know, the movie stars, the, the news anchors, the politicians, like I'm part of the majority. When I came to the United States, I, I recognized that I was now part of a minority. Now, I also grew up in other parts of uh, in Germany and in Italy. 
so there I was a minority and, you know, I got the usual like kids making fun of Asians because they'd never seen Asians before. And I looked different, but by and large, you know, as, as a minority, when you look out and you see people, you actually don't remember frequently that you don't look like them. And it's, uh, Margaret Cho has this incredible little story about being on an airplane, right? And there are two choice, entree choices of the ladies coming down with a cart. And it's just gonna, you know, pasta, Asian chicken salad, pasta, Asian chicken salad, right? She's just going down the cart. People are picking their entrees. Stops at her and says, pasta, chicken salad. Mm. Right, and the, the 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 attendant has suddenly said, "Oh, well, oh, this isn't really Asian." And I mean, it's it's sort of Asian chicken salad, but for for whatever reason, it just suddenly clicks to him that oh, maybe he shouldn't call it Asian chicken salad. And so she's reminded of her otherness, and it's jarring because you've been listening to Asian chicken salad, Asian chicken salad. You know, she, she probably wouldn't have cared if he had said Asian chicken salad. This was not an act of microaggression or anything. He, he just suddenly became aware of that. And it is that moment of being reminded that you are not like, that is, it, it gives you pause. Sometimes it's, innocuous like that Asian chicken salad story. And sometimes it is looking at, you know, that woman being beat up in New York by someone who was obviously mentally unstable. You know, he, he was on parole for having stabbed his mother or something. I, this is not, but then watching those guards in you know because there was that video of the cctv strip where they ignore that beating and you suddenly think to yourself did they ignore that beating because she didn't look like them and you know that woman is a 60 year old asian woman she could have been my aunt you know it, it's it's that reminder that you are not like and sometimes being reminded that you are not like the others is a, is a source of strength because you're like, well, I'm no, you know, I'm not a number, I'm not a cog in the machine. And sometimes that reminder that you are not like gives you that sense of vulnerability. And we're never gonna be identical to each other. And that is the amazing thing that this country has going for it that we don't all look the same. We don't all come to problems with the same perspective and that's our source of strength. But when that reminder that we are not like translates into fear or apprehension, you know, the, that, that talk that African-American parents have with their kids about, you know, when you're out there driving at night and you get stopped, you know, keep your hands on the wheel. It, like, we don't have those conversations with all of our kids. It's parents of African-American kids that have that conversation. And that reminder, I think, when we can get to where difference doesn't translate into fear or apprehension or harm, which obviously it does, that's when we will sort of realize the, the full promise of America. And it's every reminder that sometimes difference means harm or fear that begins to inhibit how you show up in society, mm -hmm. which is our loss. It's, it's, it's the country's loss. Right. right. So, so Mari, as, what words would you say to those who are, outside the AAPI community who would desire allyship? Um, what, what words of, of, of instruction and guidance would you say to those who want to be good allies in this challenging time? 
Well, I think the the probably the same principles apply in terms of allyship that you know we we seek to uh, manifest for any other minorities. If you see someone being harassed, you know, in in public transportation, and it, it may be because you know someone's being harassed because they're Asian because they are a woman for whatever reason, right? But nonetheless, if, it's a, if it is an Asian woman who is being harassed in, in, in a bus or something, she fears it's because of what she looks like. You know, engage with her so that, you know, start a conversation so that even as she's being harassed, she knows that there's somebody beside her who is on her side, right? I mean, they tell you don't engage with a harasser because that can lead to adverse outcomes. Engage with a person who is being harassed, let her know that you're on in her corner and help diffuse the situation, hope that the harasser moves away, whatever. If it escalates, you know, engage and try to find other people to, to sort of create a, a uh, safe uh, space for the person. So that's when something is happening, right? I think when something isn't happening and, you know, you think it is possible that someone is sort of privately fearing, you know, going outside and um, being, you know, the target of, of hate, whether it is, um, you know, whether it rises to the level of a hate crime or something, check in with them, right? Say, hey, you feeling okay about walking over to the parking garage tonight? Do you want me to walk with you? It, because in these times, we have a slightly heightened, those fears may not be grounded. There may not be any real danger, empirically, we, we just don't know. But if you feel that way, it is, you know, incredibly comforting to know that someone is aware that you might be feeling that way. Um, so I, I think all the general rules of allyship apply, whether it is to women, to African-Americans, to Latino uh, uh, communities, it's, it's all the same. Well, Mari, you uh, have been in uh, Jacksonville for a relatively short time, but you've already made a huge impact. And it's going to be fun to watch uh, how your leadership at the DuPont Fund uh, continues to make our uh, community a better place. Uh, and on behalf of Nancy and myself and everyone uh, associated with One Jacks, we really appreciate the time that you've given us to, to have this conversation. And uh, we look forward to many more. So uh, we uh, hope you have a good day and thanks for being a part uh, of this time with us. Thank you, Mari. Thank you.